Okay, I think we can get going. So good afternoon, everyone, and happy National Teaching Assistance Day. Um, welcome to our Empowering Teaching Assistance webinar. Um, so before we get started, just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the webinar is going to run for about 45 minutes um, and finish at 4.30. Um, as you probably noticed, your cameras and your microphones are off and so is your chat box. So if you have any questions, um, if you just pop them in the Q&A box, which is just at the bottom of your screen, um, and they, these will be answered in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So, as you all know, today marks National Teaching Assistance Day. We hope that you've all had a chance to participate in some way, whether that is celebrating with your schools or joining in on social media. Before we get started, we just wanted to say a huge congratulations to all the winners of today's awards. We really appreciate all it is that you do. And here they are. We've got Kelly Parker, Kerry Mills, uh, Samantha, sorry, I can't see, Insia Dungawala, Erin Knapman, Jack Ball, and Chloe Llewellyn. So again, huge congratulations to you all. Um, today is all about recognising the great work that you do as teaching assistants, and we hope this webinar gives you the opportunity to explore all the options available to you. So without further ado, let me pass you over to Rebecca from Best Practice Network. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, thanks, Kira, and happy TA Day, everyone. I um, hope we've had a really nice, relaxing Friday, and it's not been too mad and hopefully some of you will have had some nice celebrations and some nice cards and yeah it'd be lovely to hear um if you've had anything nice happen to you if you wanted to write something in the q a box about like your experience today that'd be nice um so i'm rebecca i work for best practice network in their communications team um so today and first of all thanks thanks a lot for joining us and i hope we, we'll be able to come away from this feeling like a, an empowered teaching assistant um, and looking at all the training opportunities that's that's available to you through Best Practice Network. So I'll start with a little bit more about ourselves. So Best Practice Network has been a training provider in the UK, uh, specifically England, for 20 years now. And we actually started with HLTA. Um, so TAs are really important to us and um just the incredible work that you do and all, most of our training programs have kind of built from that. So over the years, we've started to do more CPD programs and get a huge infrastructure of facilitators and schools around England, teaching programs, um, every aspect of the school environment from school business managers to executive leaders. Um, and now we even do international programs as well. Around three years ago, we started and branched out into apprenticeships, which is two of the options of the programmes that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, today we're going to be looking at three programmes overall that are aimed at teaching assistants to, um, and support staff and giving you an opportunity to gain further qualifications and really put the power in your hands when, cho what, when choosing what next to do next in your career. Uh, there's a lot of options and the more informed you are with the routes available, the further you can go and really we believe the sky's the limit and we want every learner to have the same opportunities. Uh, we're the only provide, we're one of the only providers in the UK that offer the full golden thread of CPD from teaching assistance to initial teacher training, early career framework through to MPQs and leadership MPQs. So we really love to see all of our learners kind of build up and work their whole career pathway with Best Practice Network kind of along, along with you guys through your career. Um, we, Today, we're really aiming for you to come away with an awareness of the programmes that you can undertake and really strengthen your knowledge and support and raise the level of education in your school. Um, at BPN, our core value is inspire learning and we want to inspire you to take on new challenges and then really inspire the children to learn and give everyone the same kind of access to education in the country. So I hope that you gain something from this and, and uh, if anything, it would be a really nice little Friday night, Friday inspirational afternoon. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to Anna, who's going to be starting off with um, teaching assistant level three. Anna, Anna is our apprenticeship performance manager for England, uh, for, sorry. London. Um, <laughs> East. Yeah, not the whole of it. <laughs> that would be no. far too much. Um, but yeah, I'll pass over to you, Anna, and thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Rebecca. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anna, a performance manager for um, Apprenticeship for London. 
And I would like to talk to you about Teaching Assistant Level 3 Apprenticeship that we offer at a Best Practice Network. Um, so the Level 3 Teaching Assistant Apprenticeship is ideal for anyone already working in or looking for a career in a teaching supporting role. Um, you, when, when you enter our apprenticeship, you, you also uh, can choose um, your own pathways based on your choice of specialist areas. The program uh, lasts for 15 months plus EPA period. I will be talking about EPA and what it is um, so you're fully aware. Um, so together it should be 18 months. So 15 months and EPA period, um, three months. So uh, what is apprenticeship? Apprenticeship can uh, be for new or existing staff, but must cover new learning. Uh, Becky, if we if we go to the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, apprentices get a paying job with a valuable training while they work towards nationally recognized apprenticeship standard. So it means you work and you learn and you gain qualification once uh, while you at work. Um, apprenticeships are work-based training programs that are designed to help employers train people for specific job roles. Um, there are so many benefits of a TA apprenticeship. Um, next slide, Becky. Um, so as you can see, uh, you can um, help understanding, uh, develop social skills, develop independence, develop um, um, support emotional well-being. Um, as, as you know, teaching assistant is doing a lot, a lot good things, many good things uh, when they in classrooms. Um, and our apprenticeship will just help you to develop them even further. Um, because you are very important people um, in the classroom who support teachers, but not just the teachers, but who work with children. And that's the most crucial part. Um, who is um, who is a TA apprenticeship for? Again, um, so what are the requirements? Uh, you must be employed as a teaching assistant with support from your school and levy account holder or apprenticeship service account holder. Support from your line manager, designated mentor to work with you throughout the program and support you with 20% of the job training. Um, job training includes webinars, portfolio preparation, shadowing, reading, studying, and time to attend review meetings. Also, to set the plan for the on-the-job training according to your individual learning plan. So every learner will, be, uh, will receive individual learning plan um, uh, that uh, will follow together with the tutor, assigned tutor. Um, you have to have GCSE in English and Maths at grade C, which is four or above, to, to be able to achieve level two English and Maths wise on program. Uh, that is also fully supported on one-to-one -one basis. Um, you also um, have to hold a residency in the UK for the last three years. So that's our requirement. Um, how we deliver our apprenticeship. Um, thank you. So delivery includes half termly, four to six due to on-site visits to carry out observations and professional discussions in the school workplace. An extensive curriculum with 17 knowledge, um, 16 skills and six behaviors that help support the class teacher um, um, enhance learning. Six weekly remote face-to-face -face online reviews with the tutor and the head teacher, line manager or mentor. So you can choose, um, you must have a mentor at, at work, but it, it can vary. So it can be a head teacher, it can be your class teacher, it can be your line manager, or it can be um, your colleague um, who is qualified already who you work with. Um, we uh, oh, The delivery also includes a reflective CPD online journal or blog one-to-one -one teaching ses sessions with your dedicated um, uh, tutor, assessor, group webinars and online catch-ups, HLTO competencies and career development, and individual learning plans. So as you can see, we have eight core modules covering 16 knowledge statements, 16 skills, oh, sorry, 17 knowledge statements, 16 skills, and six behaviors. So this is our criteria. This is what you will be studying. Um, 
also uh, already mentioned about a specialist area. You can, next slide, thank you. Uh, you can choose your specialist area uh, and we offer five, five different special, uh, specialist areas. Uh, all learners must select and complete one specialism on program. So you can complete one, you must complete one, it's, it's suggested, uh, but you can complete more if you complete one and you're happy with it and, uh, uh, and you're willing to do more you can do. Uh, you can choose more than one, but must uh, ensure this is discussed with your employer and a tutor. Um, so that uh, time spent on this specialism doesn't um, interfere with your job role or your um, course, apprenticeship course. Um, so we advise completion of one specialism and a time between month six and month 11. So you don't start them from the beginning. Uh, we want you to settle down and to settle in and and um, then once you're confident and comfortable to choose your spe specialist area. Endpoint assessment. Um, so at the end of your apprenticeship, after 15 months, um, you will have endpoint assessment. Endpoint assessment is the final assessment completed by independent assessor. Um, we have two methods. One method, the first one, is practical observation with questions and answers. The practical observation will be carried out over two hours, plus minus 10%. Um, the question and answer session will last for 15 minutes after the observation um, to discuss observation and top up um, anything that wasn't witnessed uh, and will take place at the end of each observation. Whenever possible, the practical observation should be undertaken by an independent assessor, so we call them endpoint assessor, over a period of one day with each session lasting for at least 30 minutes, depending on the needs of the employer and practical observation opportunities. So we say it's two hours observation, but you can split it into four 30 minute sessions because um, we know it's it's very difficult to um, to observe everything within two hours block. So you can do two sessions in the morning, you can do two sessions in the afternoon, or you can do three sessions in the morning, um, et cetera. Um, so after that uh, professional uh, practical observation, we have professional discussions supported by portfolio of evidence. And the portfolio of evidence should be given to the independent assessor two weeks before the uh, professional discussion taking place although it is not assessed by the independent assessor, it will enable them to prepare for the professional discussion. So based on the portfolio, they're gonna prepare questions for professional discussion. So it's all about you and how you present uh, yourself and how you work and what you do. Uh, the professional discussion will last for um, uh, a duration of 90 minutes, so hour and a half plus minus 10%. The professional discussion will be a structured discussion between the apprentice and independent assessor, following the practical observation to establish the apprentice's understanding and application of the knowledge, skills, and behaviors. So like I said already, uh, your criteria, something that you're gonna um, work towards to, to achieve, um, to be successful um, on your endpoint assessment. So that's um, um, briefly <laughs> everything about our apprenticeship. If you want to find out um, more about this, then uh, please feel free to contact us. You've got the link here um, on, the, on the PowerPoint. Uh, the next intake for the TA Level 3 apprenticeship begins in November 2023. So please, if you're interested, and I hope you are, uh, apply by the 15th of October. Um, successful learners are oh, also when you when you finish your apprenticeship um when you're successful you will be eligible to apply for a fast track hlta with best practice network once they are, once you complete your level three qualification um on program you will learn the development of a specialist area uh you're going to familiarize yourself with hlta assessments and delivery 
and you're going to familiarize yourself with HLTA standards and a greater knowledge and understanding of whole class teaching. So to find out more about H HLTA, I will pass you over to Nick, who will tell you more about HLTA. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was um, really good to see that, that first step for many people that we work with on this pathway. Um, we've been working at BPN for uh, actually a little over 19 years now on HLTA. And we have a very high success rate with 99% of our candidates being successful at HLTA assessment. And uh, we're very proud of that. We have this available online now on a national basis. There are also some local face-to-face -face groups. And we assess your ability as a, a higher level teaching assistant through three methods, uh, written examples of your work, interviews, and also the documents that you use. And I'll tell you more about each of those areas in a moment. There are 33 standards for HLTA, and you have to meet all of those standards to be successful. Um, if you are a hardworking teaching assistant who by Friday afternoon is exhausted, the chances are you've actually met all 33 every single week. In fact, some of you meet all 33 by break on Monday morning. One of those standards is standard 11, and that is actually achieved before you start. So that's about having that grade C or an equivalent in English and maths uh, before you start with us. And we can give you much more information about um, what the alternatives are if you haven't got those. And there are two principal routes into HLTA with us. You might have done the apprenticeship route that Anna's just been talking about. And in that case, we can tailor your experience based on uh, what you've done so far, uh, what your strengths are. We can tailor your experience on HRTA. Um, but also we have people who join us, and this is their, their first piece of training in many cases, and it's about the experience that they've had. And what we, what we mean here is that they've had a wide range of experience in any kind of school, could be a special or specialist school, secondary, primary, in any part of England, um, but you'll need to have done a wide range of one-to-one -one teaching, small group teaching, and some experience of whole class teaching. So how do we do this? How do we set about this? Well, first of all, we uh, set you up on a, something called Canvas, which is a platform where you can see a whole range of support materials. And uh, we ask you to watch a short video and read a, a task before you come along to day one. On day one, we do a session of around an hour and a half on, on Zoom where we outline in, in detail some of the particular standards and some of the activities you have to engage in. And then uh, we give you uh, a little bit of homework, to be honest, uh, some, some things to go away and, and do and lots of support to do that. And we give you some um, feedback on that. And then uh, eventually you come back for your day two, about six to eight weeks later. And we actually tailor that day based on what you've been doing online, based on um, the feedback that you've had. So everybody's experience of the, particularly the morning of day two, um, that varies uh, greatly. But we'll do a morning again of about an hour and a half. You have a gap in the middle of the day to, to work. Uh, on, on things and, and maybe discuss things in school or with colleagues or check things online. And then we do an hour and a half in the afternoon. And then your assessment day there is enormously. We're really flexible. We want to uh, have your assessment day suit your particular school, your circumstances and your needs. So your assessment day can be four to 12 weeks later. Some people have asked for an extension to go a little bit more than 12 weeks, but we say aim for four to 12 weeks and uh, then it's moderated. And one of the things that we really push is this idea that because we are so confident that you can be successful, uh, we really like to push the idea that you should be planning right from the start how you're going to celebrate because you will be successful on HLTA with us. And I'll tell you now what you've got to do to be successful. Slide, please. So one of the things you have to do is write about your work. Um, you need to write about a good lesson that you've had on a one-to-one -one basis. And it's not just that activity of 
walking up to a, a child who's working in class or a student who's working in, in class and uh, explaining a little bit more about what they're doing. But this is a proper uh, full one-to-one -one, um, activity where you've got a clear aim, a clear purpose that you're working towards. And um, you can actually assess it at the end on a simple level maybe, but you can assess it on the end and you can be confident that you can say, this was a successful lesson. Today, the learner has gone away with new knowledge or a new skill or some new level of understanding. Then you have to write about a group um, lesson that you've done. It, that varies enormously, but usually we say three to eight uh, learners. In special schools, it's often uh, smaller than that. It just, it really does vary enormously. We're very flexible according to your context. One of the things that's new and takes you a step on compared to the apprenticeship is this requirement to demonstrate that you can teach a whole class without a teacher present, without a teacher influencing what's going on in any way, shape or form. It may be that a teacher has written a lesson uh, or it's a centrally used lesson plan, but you've delivered the whole lesson. You've set out to the learners what the objectives are. You've given a full uh, presentation about it. You've practiced things with the learners. You've checked at the end that they've been successful. And then you have to write about five other things that you've done. And it literally can be anything. If you start work, let's say, at half past eight on Monday morning and you finish at four on Friday, if it happened in school in those hours, you can write about it. Perhaps an incident in the corridor maybe an assembly that you were involved in, perhaps a school trip. You just write about that. And we give you lots of examples and lots of coaching and lots of support to enable you to do that. And we also ask you to share with us some documents that you've used from your work. So one of the most common things for people to use is examples of, of the learners or uh, that, you know, whether it be children or, or older students, uh, examples of their work. So let's say you've been working particularly hard on raising standards and raising expectations, and one of your learners produces a particularly impressive piece of work that you think just shows how well you've succeeded in having the learners um, achieve even more than they ever imagined possible. Then you would share that and would tell us just a little bit about it. And um, maybe you put up a display of a range of uh, learners' work. Uh, you would take a photograph of that, you could share that with us. Perhaps you've had a safeguarding situation or an emergency in school, and you could show us the small extract of the relevant policy that you operated, and uh, you can share that with us. And of course, you can share lesson plans that you've used. And then there's the bit that a lot of people really feel that they want to have uh, plenty of practice for and we do, do do encourage people to talk about all of this in school and and practice with with other people uh, even practice with a family pet if necessary but having to have a conversation about your work is something that we all do at work but when it's in a formal setting it can feel a bit sort of a, a little bit more challenging so um really what it is though is we're going to say to you Let's say, for instance, on standards 10, 17 and 18, they're all a group of standards about what you're really good at at school. Perhaps you're absolutely brilliant in your school at delivering phonics. Maybe you're, uh, you have a background in science and so you've helped deliver some science. And with those standards, you might be saying, um, I became really good at this through years of practice, standard 10. I uh, became good at this because I did an A-level in it uh, and I, and I, or I've been on a night class with it. And then 17, you can be, this is a standard where you'd be telling us um, how you contribute to what's going on in the school. And it might be quite simple. Perhaps you're in a, um, an early years class and you'll be saying to the others, well, you know, I, I, I'm really uh, good at this bit of the phonics. If I deliver this, why don't you deliver that? By the way, I found this fantastic resource. So you're, you're working as part of a team to share planning and development really. And then 18 is about you drilling down and telling us more about what you personally did. So you will talk to us about how you have delivered those standards. And a teacher who knows you would also talk, talk about that. And they might be asked about your ability to meet standard 29. And so, that, so the assessor might say to them, um, do you find that this person works really well on a one-to-one -one basis? 
Are they successful? Have you seen that the learners have got outcomes which show they've learned something new? Yes, yes, the teacher's going to say, of course I have. And that'll be standard 29. And the head teacher will also be asked, or quite often the head teacher asks a colleague to do it for them. And they might be asked also about standard 30, which is small groups, and 31, which is teaching the whole class. So really, it's just to recap, it's that idea that you're going to write about your work. We'll give you lots of support to do that. You're going to show us documents that relate to your work. We'll give you lots of guidance there as well. And you'll talk about your work and others will talk about your successes and your achievements too. So again, if this is something that you think is interesting, we regularly publish um, the latest deadline. We're actually processing right now, as I speak, we're processing the people who've just applied, but you can, you can certainly get online and apply uh, as soon as you want to. And uh, it may even be that in a few weeks, there's a, a space that you could join. But even if there isn't, um, certainly uh, next term, there's always new groups. There's always that opportunity uh, for you to um, carry on and work with us. Uh, do get in touch if you need to know any more about how this would work in your school and your particular context. Over to you, Sean. Thanks, Nick. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, just to reiterate what my colleagues have said, I hope you've had a lovely National TA Day today. Um, the final uh, part of our presentation is a progression route on um, from being a teaching assistant and working in that supportive role in school to becoming a qualified teacher um, and best practice network. Um, we're we are developing um, a career pathway, if you like, from TA to, um, to qualified teacher status through the postgraduate teacher apprenticeship. Um, and this is a particularly exciting route for us. It's brand new for this year. We've started um, our first cohort this September. Um, and what we found is that um, it's particularly popular because it's it's an alternative route to a traditional university teacher training route where uh, candidates have to get student finance um, and there is a, a, an individual uh, sort of cost and, and financial uh, commitment there. This is actually a, a route where our trainees are employed by the school for the duration of their apprenticeship. They're learning on the job. Um, and they're paid a wage now on the unqualified teacher pay scale. So um, at Best Practice Network, we, as I said, we started our first cohort this September with primary. Um, so we've got uh, postgraduate teacher apprentices um, specialising in either three to seven or five to 11. Um, and from September 24, we're expanding that offer um, to offer a primary SEND specialism. And then in secondary, um, we will have uh, postgraduate uh, teacher apprenticeships uh, focusing or specialising in um, secondary education 11 to 16 or 14 to 19 um, in uh, a number of subjects. So we're, we're looking at English, maths, chemistry, biology, uh, computing, geography, French and Spanish. Um, and we um, are excited that um, this is a, a great opportunity, I think, for people who are currently in school, who uh, know the, the systems and the routines in their school uh, to upskill. Um, and so it might be that you've done your level three teaching assistant apprenticeship or you've been with uh, Nick and his team completing your HLTA. And it's that element of of what next. So what does it look like? What does a, a postgraduate teacher apprenticeship look like? Um, so as I said, there's no fees. And, you know, at the moment with cost of living crisis and um, you know, difficulties that we're all facing, this is a really advantageous route for, um, for the, the apprentice. Trainees are, uh, teachers are employed by the school, so they're learning on the job. So some of our, our apprentices are working alongside an experienced class teacher, building up their teaching experience so that by the end of their apprenticeship, they'll be teaching 80% of um, the, the, the teaching over the course of a week. Other apprentices have been working as a, a HLTA or cover supervisor already, um, and they are uh, responsible for a class um, or they're, they're job sharing with an experienced teacher. And so they're already um, teaching a, a good proportion of, um, of the lessons each week. Um, and again, they're, they're building that up over the course of the year. 
Similar to HLTA, we need to have uh, GCSEs in English, uh, maths, and if you want to do primary in science as well, at grade C or grade four or above. Um, and there is a requirement for uh, people to have a bachelor's degree um, in a grade two, two or above. Now that can be in any subject. Um, and what we will do is work with you on your subject knowledge over the course of the apprenticeship. So it's salaried, you're employed in the school, you are uh, gaining the majority of your experience, learning from experienced colleagues within school, but you have um, an in-school mentor, somebody who can support, guide, challenge you, can observe your practice, can set uh, teaching targets for you on a day-to-day -day basis in school. And then from Best Practice Network, you have the support of a personal apprenticeship tutor, that person, similarly to, to the role that they perform on the level three uh, TA apprenticeship, will come into school uh, every half term. They will observe you. They will set teaching targets for you. They will work with you uh, both face-to-face uh, -face and online as you build up your teaching file uh, and put together a portfolio of evidence that eventually uh, will be used uh, as evidence against the teacher's standards. We have, uh, as Anna said, 20% uh, um, off the job training. Um, and that means that uh, it equates to roughly one day out of the week where you will be with us for what we call center based training. And we built our curriculum um, using the core curriculum content framework. Um, and we've split that into six modules that we've designed um, over the course of the year. So our apprentices joined us uh, at the end of August this year for what we call our first day of learning. They engaged in sort of pre-program activities and they're currently studying module one um, as they will do until uh, the end of, of, of this term. So they're focusing on um, aspects of the curriculum that they learn with us on a Friday um, and that's things that they can put into practice on Monday morning when they return into the classroom uh, with their children. A requirement for qualified teacher status, whether it's an apprenticeship or uh, a fee funded route, is that every candidate has assessed experience in at least two schools. Now, our employment school is is the um, is where our, your apprentice will gain the majority of their experience. But we do have to organise a contrasting placement for a minimum of five weeks um, so so that the apprentice gets that opportunity to perhaps explore a different year group, uh, gain experience in a, in a school um, that has a, a different demographic of children um, and can learn from, from other expert colleagues. And then they return back to their employment school and complete the rest of their apprenticeship um, in, in their own school. The uh, apprenticeship is slightly longer than a, a postgraduate fee funded route in that it spans four terms. And that's because uh, according to the rules of um, apprenticeships, you have to be on programme for a minimum of a year and a day. So our apprentices will start with us in August and they will finish the following September um, as they go through endpoint assessments, which uh, Anna was talking about earlier, very similar. It's an observation and a professional discussion and it um, confirms qualified teacher status. That mean, also means that then finishing uh, the apprenticeship in September, our newly qualified teachers um, will be able to join the early career teacher pathway uh, from October onwards. Um, we've designed our curriculum so that each module begins with something called intensive training and practice. Um, and these intensive training and practice weeks uh, take a, a very granular focus on a, a specific aspect of the curriculum, um, which enables you as the apprentice to, to learn about the, the research behind um, theories of education and, and aspects of our curriculum, and then take that into the classroom to immediately practice it, to discuss it with your um, in-school mentor, um, and, and, uh, and to reflect and refine um, your, your skills. And then you focus on specific aspects of the curriculum through a blend of face-to-face, -face, online and, uh, and study modules so that you will cover uh, our curriculum and all the subjects within the national curriculum as well. So as I said, the entry requirements, you have to have a, a degree at a 2-2 or above. Um, if you are an international student or you gained your uh, qualifications outside of the UK, we will work with you to um, obtain an, an ENIC uh, through a service called ECTIS. You might have known uh, about it um, previously and it's 
its previous name is called NARIC, um, but they give us a very clear indication of whether your degree is equivalent to a, a UK bachelor's degree. Uh, similarly with uh, GCSEs in English, Maths and Science. Uh, a slight interesting element to the apprenticeship is that we can accept um, GCSEs, we can also accept equivalency tests for entry onto initial teacher training. Uh, however, um, for the apprenticeship endpoint assessment, if uh, a candidate doesn't have a GCSE, they, they have to engage with us in what we call functional skills um, over the course of the apprenticeship. But that all of that is looked at at the point of application and our admin team will give each individual advice um, if, if that's necessary. And of course, as Anna said, you have to have the right to work and study in the UK. So you might be a budding TA thinking, I really hope that, that my school would support me to, to um, continue my journey into qualified teacher status. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that, um, that sometimes that's possible within school and budgets allow and staffing and, um, and, and pupil numbers allow for progression. But we've also worked with um, candidates this year whose um, school have not been able to support them, unfortunately, due for, to a number of reasons. Now, we have at Best Practice Network a dedicated recruitment and support team. Um, and so what we've done this year is we've created a number of spotlights. As you can see, Chris uh, is one of our apprentice candidates. Uh, he was working uh, within a school but was not able to continue this September. And so last year we were working with Chris um, and with our sister company teaching personnel to share spotlights for Chris um, with schools that were that had particular vacancies. And so that's another service that we can offer where we can support uh, candidates to, or we can match candidates with um, a school that, that is looking for an apprentice and can support you to, um, to complete your qualified teacher status. So hopefully um, that we've provided you with lots of information. Um, we are, um, now to accepting applications for our next intake on the teacher apprenticeship uh, that starts in September 2024. You can apply now for primary um, and if you're interested in a secondary teacher apprenticeship you can register your interest um, and apply directly to our website. We have a dedicated um, administration team who uh, understand the uh, complexities of an apprenticeship uh, alongside the initial teacher training criteria and they will um, answer any questions you have or, or walk you through the application process. So thank you very much. Uh, I think Becca I'm going to hand back over to you. Thank you, yeah thank you everyone and uh, that was really really great and it's great to see the progression as well that you can take from you know just starting out as a TA and you can work your way up and it's lovely to know that now there is that route to become a qualified teacher um so I think we've got one question so far if anybody does have any other questions uh please just pop them in the in the chat box in the Q&A section and then we can get to answering them now um I think there's one that's been answered but I might just say that one out loud just so that everyone uh, can hear the answer as well. So, so Linda's asked, what's the difference between working at level three and HLT level? Um, Nick, do you want to take this one and maybe just answer it live just so everyone can hear as well? One of the things I found, I'd be interested to know what, what my colleagues think. So one of the things I found is that the way individual schools interpret um, the rules and the processes vary enormously. Um, but the official answer that I would give is that it's an HLTA, a person with HLTA status, who can teach a whole class without a teacher present. Um, that is that is what has been something that we've worked on for nearly 20 years. But it does seem to vary in how people interpret it and uh, how they pay for it uh, seems to vary enormously from school to school. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got Sarah who's asked, is there a route from HLTA to trainee teacher if you don't have a degree already? Interesting question, Sarah. Um, and my response to that would be to watch this space um, because the Department of Education uh, are working with the Institute for Apprenticeships at the moment on a non-degree route to qualified teacher status. So it's, it's in development. It's not here yet, um, but it, watch this space. It, it is on its way. Yeah, that's really exciting. And then when that does come through and things like that, make sure, we will definitely make sure that everyone is aware of it on our channels and, and, and emails and things. So, yeah, don't think you'll miss out on that one. 
Um, does anybody have any other questions before we finish today? Um, just so that you know as well, we, this has been recorded, so we will send out the presentation and the slides so that has all the information and also the links to get onto the website and to apply there as well. Um, 